Dear students, today we are reading Chapter 8, Silk Road by Mick Middleton, and this is Part 3. The author is traveling along the ancient trade route called Silk Road. He left a place called Ravu with a gifted, long-sleeved sheepskin coat. Lamo, the lady who had provided them accommodation at Ravu, gave the author a gift of this long-sleeved sheepskin coat as they were going to Mount Kailash, where it would be very cold. The author left Rabu accompanied by Daniel and Setan. Daniel was an interpreter and Setan was a guide and the owner of the car hired by the author for the journey. Setan knew a shortcut to reach the mountain. He said the journey would be smooth if there was no snow. As they passed by the hills, they could see some gazelles, wild ass, and some drogbas, some shepherds, nomads, looking after their herds. As they passed the drogba tents, their guard dogs, Tibetan mastiffs, chased their car for some distance. As they climbed, the turns became sharper and bumpier. The sudden and unexpected fall of snow blocked their way a number of times. After passing through the top of the pass, they went down to reach the small town of Hor, on the shore of Lake Manasarova. The author describes Hor as a grim, miserable place without any vegetation. It only had a lot of accumulated rubbish, dust and rocks. From there, Daniel went back to Lhasa. The author and Tsetan are repairing the punctured tires and after that, they carry on. But I had to wait. Tsetan told me to go and drink some tea in Hor's only cafe which, like all the other buildings in town, was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows. The good view of the lake through one of them helped to compensate for the draft. The author is having some tea in horse only cafe. This cafe, like all the other buildings in town, is badly constructed. It is constructed from badly painted concrete and it has three broken windows. However, one of these windows has a good view. The good view of the lake through one of these windows helped to compensate for the draft, for the cool air, a current of cool air. I was served by a Chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around on my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and a thermos of tea. To spread the grease around on my table, it means he cleaned the table with a filthy rag, with a dirty cloth. Then he brought a glass and a thermos of tea. Half an hour later, Setan relieved me from my solitary confinement and we drove past a lot more rocks and rubbish westwards out of town towards Mount Kailash. After half an hour, Setan joined him. He said he relieved me from my solitary confinement. He was alone there. So when Setan came, he gave, me, he gave him company. To relieve means to cause some difficulty to become less severe. Here it means Zetan came and he was not alone anymore. He gave him company. After that, they continued. They drove past a lot more rocks than rubbish westwards out of town towards Mount Kailash. My experience in Hor came as a stark contrast to accounts I dread of earlier travelers' first encounters with Lake Manasarova. The author said, What I have experienced was quite different. 
than the accounts that I read, the accounts of earlier travelers. He says, my experience in Hor came as a stark contrast. Stark means sharp or severe. It was a sharp contrast to what I have read. Contrast to accounts I read of earlier travelers first encounters with Lake Manasarovar. Ekai Kawaguchi, a Japanese monk who had arrived there in 1900, was so moved by the sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears. He was moved, he was touched by the holiness. And he burst into tears. A couple of years later, the hallowed waters had a similar effect on Swedhedin, a Swede who wasn't prone to sentimental outbursts. Few years later, this holy waters had a similar effect on Swedhedin, who wasn't prone, he wasn't likely to have sentimental outbursts. However, he too was moved. He wasn't prone means to he wasn't likely to have sentimental outbursts. Prone to means to be inclined. It was dark by the time we finally left again and after 10.30 p.m. we drew up outside the guest house in Darchen for what turned out to be another troubled night. Kicking around in the open-air rubbish dump that passed for the town of Hor had set off my cold once more. Though, if truth be told, it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea. It was dark by the time they left again. After 10.30 p.m., it means it was dark, we drew up outside the guest house in Dachen for what turned out to be another troubled night. Kicking around. Kicking around means walking around or passing time aimlessly. In the open air rubbish dump that passed for the town of Hor had set off my cold once more. He had called. Though, if truth be told, he says, though, Honestly, it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea. The herbal tea that he had in horse only cafe didn't help the cold. One of my nostrils was blocked again, and as I lay down to sleep, I wasn't convinced that the other would provide me with sufficient oxygen. My watch told me I was at 4,760 meters. It wasn't much higher than Rabu, and there I'd been gasping for oxygen several times every night. I'd grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances by now, but they still scared me. The author says he was suffering from cold. One of his nostrils was blocked again, and as he lay down to sleep, he wasn't convinced, he wasn't sure that the other nostril would provide him enough oxygen. They were at 4,760 meters. The author says it wasn't much higher than Rabu from where they left and there in Rabu he says I've been gasping for oxygen several times every night. Gasping means catching breath. He was catching breath several times times every night. I'd grown accustomed. I got used to these nocturnal disturbances. Nocturnal means happening at night. So he got used to these disturbances which happen in the night. However, he was still scared. They still, still scared me. Tired and hungry, I started breathing through my mouth. After a while, 
I switched to single nostril power, which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen, but just as I was drifting off, I woke up abruptly. He was tired and hungry, and since he couldn't breathe on both nostrils, he says I started breathing through my mouth. After some time, he switched to single nostril power, to single nostril breathing, which seemed it looked I'm getting enough oxygen, but just as I was drifting off, just as I was going to sleep, I woke up abruptly. He woke up suddenly. Something was wrong. My chest felt strangely heavy and I sat up, a movement that cleared my nasal passages almost instantly and relieved the feeling in my chest. Curious, I thought. The author is suffering from cold. He says, as I sat up, my nasal passages got cleared almost instantly, almost immediately. He felt relieved. I lay back down and tried again. Same result. I was on the point of disappearing into the land of Nod when something told me not to. To disappear into the land of Nod means to go to sleep. Going to fall asleep. He says, I was about to fall asleep when something told me not to. It must have been those emergency electrical impulses again, but this was not the same as on previous occasions. This time I wasn't gasping for breath. I was simply not allowed to go to sleep. This time he was not breathless. He was simply not allowed to go to sleep. He couldn't sleep. Sitting up once more immediately made me feel better. I could breathe freely and my chest felt fine. After he sat up, he felt better. But as soon as I lay down, my sinuses filled and my chest was odd. He couldn't lie down. The moment he would lie down, he was feeling very strange and his sinuses were getting filled. I tried propping myself upright against the wall, but now I couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off. He was trying to propping himself. Propping myself upright means to hold up, to support or keep in position. He was trying to keep a position upright against the wall, but now he couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off, to sleep. I couldn't put my finger on the reason, but I was afraid to go to sleep. I couldn't put my finger on the reason means I couldn't pinpoint. I couldn't exactly tell what was the reason, but I was afraid to go to sleep. A little voice inside me was saying that if I did, I might never wake up again, so I stayed awake all night. He was not going to sleep because he was afraid he will not wake up again. Setan took me to the Darchen Medical College the following morning. The medical college at Darchen was new and looked like a monastery from the outside with a very solid door that led into a large courtyard. There was this large courtyard where Setan took him. He took him to the Darchen Medical College. He was not feeling well. The medical college was new and it looked like a monastery from the outside. We found a consulting room which was dark and cold and occupied by a Tibetan doctor who wore none of the paraphernalia that I had been expecting. Paraphernalia means he was not expecting such dress. 
the doctor was wearing a dress. Here, paraphernalia refers to the dress that was identifying his profession. No white coat. He looked like any other Tibetan with a thick pullover and a woolly hat. This doctor didn't look like a doctor. He was not wearing a white suit that would identify his profession. When I explained my sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion to lying down, he shot me a few questions while feeling the veins in my wrist. The author said I have explained my sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion. Aversion means dislike, a strong dislike. He could not force himself to lie down. He shot me a few questions. He gave me a few questions. He asked me a few things while feeling the veins in my wrist. It's cold, he said finally through Tzedan. A cold and the effects of altitude. I'll give you something for it. I asked him if he thought I'd recover enough to be able to do the Kora. Oh yes, he said. You'll be fine. The author is having cold. After getting checked by the doctor, the doctor tells him that it's the cold and the effects of altitude. And he is going to give him something. Of course, the doctor said, you'll be fine. You will be able to do the Kora, to do the pilgrimage. I walked out of the medical college, clutching a brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. Clutching means he was holding tight this brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. Screws of paper refers to small paper packets in which there was the medicine. I had a five-day course of Tibetan medicine, which I started right away. I opened an after-breakfast package and found it contained a brown powder that I had to take with hot water. It tasted just like cinnamon. This was the medicine. This brown powder was a medicine and he took it with hot water. This was an after-breakfast package. The contents of the lunchtime and bedtime packages were less obviously identifiable. He says these packages for lunchtime and bedtime, the medicine packages, were less obviously identifiable. You couldn't really tell what it is. Both contained small spherical brown pellets. Pellets refers to small, round, compressed mass of a substance. This is the medicine. They looked suspiciously like sheep dung, but of course I took them. This medicine was round, small and round. That night, after my first full day's course, I slept very soundly, like a log, not a dead man. To sleep like a log means to sleep soundly, to sleep tight. Once he saw that I was going to leave Tzedan after me, to return to Lhasa. Once he saw that I was going to leave, Tzedan left me, to return to Lhasa. The author is saying, now Tzedan could see that I'm not going to die. He saw that I was going to leave, so he left me, to return to Lhasa. Tzedan also left. As a Buddhist, he told me he knew that it didn't really matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for business. Darchen didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep. It was still dusty, partially derelict and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse, but the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the Himalayas commanded by a huge snow-capped mountain, Gurla Mandata, with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit. The author said that 
Darchen looked quite okay after a good night's sleep. It was still dusty and partially derelict. Derelict means run down in a very poor condition as a result of disuse and neglect. And punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse. Punctuated means it was dotted. There was a lot of rubble and refuse. Rubble is also some waste, such as rough fragments of stone, brick, concrete, and so on, especially after demolition of a building. However, the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the Himalayas, commanded by a huge snow-capped mountain, Gurla Mandata, with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit. He was looking at the mountain top and he says, with just a wisp. Wisp means a small piece of something. There was a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit. It means the cloud was hanging there. The town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling Chinese cigarettes, soap and other basic provisions, as well as the usual strings of prayer flags. This town had a couple of rudimentary. Rudimentary means basic or limited. Some limited shops that were selling Chinese cigarettes, soap and some basic things, basic provisions. They were also selling strings and prayer flags. In front of one, men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool, the batter table looking supremely incongruous in open air while nearby women washed their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook that babbled down past my guest house. In front of one of these stores, he says, men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool. Pool is a game similar to billiard. The battered table. The battered table means the table that was worn off, trashed or shabby. It was damaged. Battered table looking supremely incongruous. Incongruous means the table was looking very bad. It was totally out of place. Incongruous means totally out of place. The woman wash their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook. Brook is a small stream. This brook babbled down. To babble down means to flow with a bubbling sound. It was babbling down past my guest house. Darchen felt relaxed and unhurried, but for me it came with a significant drawback. There were no pilgrims. Here, the author is alone. Both Daniel and Zetan, they both went back to Lhasa. And here, he says, Darchen felt quite okay and relaxed, but there was a significant drawback. There was one thing. There were no pilgrims. He didn't see any pilgrims. I'd been told that at the height of the pilgrimage season, the town was bustling with visitors. There were many visitors. Full of activity. Bustling with visitors means it was full of activities. Many brought their own accommodation, enlarging the settlement round its edges as they set up their tents, which spilled down onto the plain. There were many people and they would enlarge the settlement. They would put their tents around the edges, they would set these tents and the settlement would be enlarged. It would be bigger. It was looking bigger. There were many people. I timed my arrival for the beginning of the season, but it seemed I was too early. 
he timed his arrival. He was trying to make sure that he comes for the beginning of the season, but it looked like he came too early. One afternoon, I sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in Darchin's only cafe. He sat and he was thinking about his options. What to do? After a little consideration, I concluded they were severely limited. His options were severely limited. Clearly, I hadn't made much progress with my self-help program on positive thinking. He was not thinking very positive. In my defense, I hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties. But however I looked at it, I could only wait. He was still not feeling very well, he could not sleep, but he says, however I looked at it, I could only wait and see. The pilgrimage trail was well trodden, but I didn't fancy doing it alone. He didn't want to do it alone. He says the pilgrimage trail was well trodden. Well trodden means much frequented by visitors. However, he didn't fancy doing it alone. He didn't feel like doing it alone. The Kora was seasonal because parts of the route were liable to blockage by snow. This Kora, the pilgrimage, was happening in the season because parts of the route were liable to blockage by snow. Liable to means they were likely or responsible to be blocked by snow. I had no idea whether or not the snow had cleared, but I wasn't encouraged by the chunks of dirty ice that still clung to the banks of Darchen's brook. He said he had no idea whether there was still snow or not, but he wasn't encouraged. He wasn't very confident about the snow up there, seeing the chunks, seeing these big parts of dirty ice that were still clinging to the banks of Darchen's brook. This ice was still holding tight to the banks of Darchen's stream, Darchen's brook. Since Zetan had left, I hadn't come across anyone in Darchen with enough English to answer even this most basic question. Zetan left back to Lhasa. Now the author was alone and he says I couldn't find anyone, I hadn't come across anyone in Darchen with enough English to answer this most basic question. Is there any snow? Until, that is, I met Norbu. The cafe was small, dark and cavernous with a long metal stall that ran down the middle. Here he meets Norbu. Norbu is a Tibetan working at an academy in Beijing who wants to carry out the pilgrimage to Mount Kailash. The f- cafe was small, dark and cavernous. Cavernous means like a cave. With a long metal stall that ran down the middle. The walls and ceiling were written in sheets of multicolored plastic. Here he says that the walls and ceiling were written. It means covered. They were covered in sheets of multicolored plastic of the striped variety, broad blue, red and white, that is made into stout voluminous shopping bags sold all over China and in many countries of Asia as well as Europe. Here he says that here the author is saying that this place was covered in plastic. He says that is made into stout voluminous shopping bags sold all over China and in many other countries of Asia as well as Europe. Stout means strong or plump. Voluminous means 
very loose or full, having much fabric. There was so many of these shopping bags. And he says they were sold all over the world. As such, plastic must rate as one of China's most successful exports along the Silk Road today. The author is saying there was so much plastic everywhere. There were also dumps with a lot of plastic. The cafe had a single window beside which I'd taken a position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. I'd also brought a novel with me to help pass the time. To keep himself entertained, he also brought a novel to read. He sat next to the window and there next to the window he could see the pages of his notebook. Norbu saw my book when he came in and he asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at my rickety table. This is when he met Norbu. Norbu came and he asked, with a gesture, if he could sit opposite him at his rickety table. Rickety means poorly made, shaky or unsteady, likely to collapse. You English? he inquired. After he'd ordered tea, I told him I was, and we struck up a conversation. They began talking. They started talking. I didn't think he was from those parts because he was wearing a windsheeter and metal rimmed spectacles of a western style. He was wearing this windsheeter, a wind resistant jacket, and the metal rimmed spectacles, spectacles that had metal frame. However, he was a Tibetan, he told me, but worked in Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Social Science, in the Institute of Ethnic Literature. I assumed he was on some sort of field work. The author said, I assumed, I presumed, he was on some sort of field work. Yes and no, he said. I have come to do the Kora, the pilgrimage. My heart jumped. Here the author's heart jumped. He was excited on hearing that he has come to do the Kora as well. Norbu had been writing academic papers about the Kailash Kora and its importance in various works of Buddhist literature for many years, he told me, but he had never actually done it himself. This is first time that Norbu is doing the Kora. When the time came for me to tell him what brought me to Darchen, his eyes lit up. We could be a team, he said excitedly. They were both excited to meet each other. Two academics who, will, who, who have escaped from the library. He says, we are two academics who have escaped from the library. It means we have removed ourselves from the academic work. Perhaps my positive thinking strategy was working after all. The author seems to be happy. He met Norbu and Norbu is also doing Kora. My initial relief at meeting Norbu, who was also staying in the guest house, was tempered by the realization that he was almost as ill-equipped as I was for the pilgrimage. He says, my initial relief at meeting Norbu means he was happy to see Norbu, to meet him, this time, because now he will have a company on his way to Mount Kailash. However, he says, he was also staying in the guest house. He was tempered, weakened by the realization that he was almost as ill-equipped as I was for the pilgrimage. It means none of them was equipped for the pilgrimage. He kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be. Very high up, he kept reminding me. So tiresome to walk. He wasn't really a practicing Buddhist, it transpired, but he had enthusiasm and he was, of course, Tibetan. The other said it was um, obvious. It means it looked like it transpired. It became obvious that 
he had, he wasn't really a practicing Buddhist, but he had enthusiasm, and of course, he was Tibetan. Although I'd originally envisaged making the trek in the company of devout believers, on reflection I decided that perhaps Norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion. Earlier, the author said, I'd originally envisaged. Envisage means imagined. He earlier thought of making the trek in the company of devout believers. Devout means having strong religious feeling or commitment. He was thinking of going with some devout believers. But then, when he thought about it, he decided that perhaps Norbu was better choice. He would be the ideal companion. He suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage, which I, which I interpreted as a good sign, as he had no intention of prostrating himself all around the mountain. Norbu is suggesting to hire some yaks. Yak is a Tibetan ox to carry the luggage. This, the author says, I interpreted as a good sign, as he, Norbu, had no intention of prostrating himself all around the mountain. Prostrating means stretching and lying down with face down while doing kora. He had no such intentions. Not possible, he cried collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter. It wasn't his style, and anyways, his tummy was too big. Norbu would laugh. He would say, not possible. That wasn't his style, and anyway, his tummy was too big for prostrating. Dear students, this was our chapter Eight, Silk Road. I hope you enjoy the story. This is all for today. Have a nice day and see you soon.